There's Iron Dome being fired up all around us right now. It's illuminating the sky here. The bangs of the Iron Dome intercepting the rockets that are being fired from Gaza just a couple of miles away. It's Tuesday, November 7th, 2023, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution production examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I will be your moderator today. Normally joined by three of my colleagues, we call the Goodfellows, but we are one good fellow shy today. John Cochran will not be joining us, but we are still graced by the presence of Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. And joining us live from London uh, a few days in advance of Remembrance Day, which might explain the poppy on his left lapel, the historian Neil Ferguson. Neil, we can't get three fellows on this show. Do you want to become the attendance officer here at Goodfellows? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of slacking going on, but uh, I've got on my three-piece suit and I'm prepared to give a Churchillian speech to rally the, the fellows. Well done. So, gentlemen, we're going to do a two-part show today. Later on, we'll be joined live from Munich by Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. He is returning to Goodfellows. He's going to discuss the war in Ukraine, the counteroffensive, and the debate in Washington over funding for the Zelensky government. But first, joining us live from Jerusalem for an update on the conflict in Israel, a very personal perspective, is our Hoover colleague, Russ Roberts. Russ Roberts is the Hoover Institution's John and Jean Denault Research Fellow and the founder of Econ Talk, the award-winning podcast. Since March of 2021, he served as the president of Shalem College, Israel's first liberal arts college. Russ, welcome to Goodfellows, and I'd like to begin by asking you this question. I was watching a journalist reporting live from Israel the other day, and she said that when the uh, sirens go off and the missiles are coming, that you have about 15 seconds to scramble. So question, sir, how do you live on a day-to-day -day basis knowing that at any moment you have to scramble for your survival? Uh, it depends where you live. Uh, Jerusalem happens to be relatively quiet. Uh, we're 50 miles from Gaza. Uh, Hezbollah has so far decided not to enter the fray. They have much more powerful and more accurate missiles. The ones that head our way, we get 90 seconds. So it's pretty, um, we're, it's pretty plush here. So we get 90 seconds to head to either a safe room or a stairwell. First day of the of the war, October 7th, the, the horrible uh, massacres. Um, we had maybe four atta uh, missile attacks in Jerusalem. Now they're once every few days, and it's pretty quiet here. Having said that, a colleague of ours uh, is cooking food for the troops, uh, making sure that they have hot meals rather than uh, horrible sandwiches that the uh, Israeli army provides them when they're uh, having to go into Gaza. And she tells me that in the kitchen that she works in close to the border, it is 20 seconds and they don't get to a shelter. They just throw themselves on the ground. So uh, it's it depends where you are. Yeah. Hey, Russ, great to be, great to be with you. You know, I, hey, first of all, condolences to you and all your Israeli fellow citizens and 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 really, you know, Jews from from uh, many countries who've been affected by the massacre on October 7th. And I, I imagine that there are very few who haven't had a family or friend uh, uh, as, a, as a victim in that horrible attack. And what, what I'd like to just ask you is, is you know, what, what you see is the psyche in 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 Israel today, and and uh, and and what, is there any debate at all about what the future course of events has to be? I mean, I know that there's been a great deal of consensus behind the need to destroy Hamas to ensure that Hamas can no longer conduct an attack, anything like that, uh, without being completely reconstituted. Uh, but but what's what's the mood and and what is the debate and the discussion today in Israel? Uh, well, thanks for the condolences and good wishes. And yes, you're right. I mean, everyone here, a lot of folks uh, have lost a loved one in the opening days of the war and are very worried right now because everyone I know has a, a son, a daughter, a husband serving right now, either at a border up north or a border with with uh, with Gaza. So it's a, it's a very tough time. Um the, the mood is, uh, there's not a lot of rage. You know, there was anger and fear and some rage for sure on October 7th, the day of the first attack. But the main mood here is resolve. Uh, you know, Israel, it's not the first time they've been attacked by Hamas. It's been, it's been a regular problem. The resolve now is, that was it. They're done. Now, whether that promise can be carried out remains to be seen. Hamas, as you know, has about 240 hostages, and we don't know where they are. That we don't know whether they're alive. We don't know what kind of condition they're in. We suspect they're all, if not most, if not all, are in 
tunnels underneath hospitals and other places are going to be very difficult to attack. So there is a great deal of unease about that, about how that those two twin the, the twin goals of eliminating Hamas's military capabilities and governance of the of the area is going to fit in with the goal of bringing the hostages back uh, alive if possible. The other thing I think there's uncertainty about here is uh, the day after. Uh, I, I call it October 8th. It's, of course, not literally uh, the day after, but October 8th, the, the, the world that Israelis live in when this reaches whatever temporary or semi-permanent end of this war, uh, Netanyahu said, I think yesterday or today, there will be an ongoing military presence in Gaza going forward. I don't think there's any taste for that among the general public. That may be a, po- a political strategic statement, but how Gaza is handled going forward is going to be a huge challenge. And of course, there's going to be an enormous political challenge because Netanyahu destroyed most of his political capital on October 7th. It was destroyed by his the lack of preparation, the surprise, the attack, the poorness of the response. And what had happened in advance of that attack politically here in the country, he, he's in deep trouble and how that gets resolved and how quickly is, of course, on people's minds as well. Ross, uh, how much attention are Israelis uh, paying to the debates that are going on in the rest of the world? Uh, I'm here in London uh, at the weekend by uh, bad planning. I and my son got mixed up in a large pro-Palestinian demonstration. And it's one of many that have uh, occurred since uh, October the 7th. Uh, haven't been uh, nearly so many pro-Israeli demonstrations, despite the fact that these hideous atrocities were perpetrated uh, by Palestinian terrorists against Israelis. And, and, and of course, on American campuses, uh, there have been some really disgraceful demonstrations yeah. of support uh, for uh, the violent action and justification uh, for these atrocities. This is something we're talking about a lot in the UK and the US. Is it something that Israelis are paying attention to? And if so, what do they think? Well, certain people are certainly paying attention to it. I think the general, um, the public face of that is uh, welcome to our world. Uh, you know, a lot of people have, have noticed that uh, when when people marched in Sydney, Australia, you know, a very tolerant multicultural country, Australia, uh, and police told the Jews not to go near the Sydney Opera House where the pro-Palestinian demonstration was being held. I think I think within a day or two of the, um, maybe three, maybe it was October 10th uh, of the tragedies, uh, that crowd chanted, chanted gas the Jews. Uh, there was nothing subtle there. Uh, From the river to the sea is a slogan you hear over and over again at these rallies. And that means the river is the Jordan and the sea is the Mediterranean. And what they mean is, to be blunt, it should be Judenrein, free of Jews, um, to use a very unpleasant word. So I think a lot of us here are thinking, well, they're where you are. We have our own problems, but you also have some issues. Uh, people who perhaps don't share the values that you would hope they would share. That certainly is is, is seems to be the case in, in many of these protests. So that's one response I think Israel has. Uh, the other response is uh, there's been a, an enormous flourishing of Jewish identity in Israel. And that sounds like a, a weird thing to say. I mean, it's a Jewish country, seven million of the citizens here of the nine or so are Jews. What do you mean there's been a flourishing of Jewish identity? As you probably know, there's a, quite a bit of conflict here between the secular society, the, the non-religious typically living in places like Tel Aviv versus the more religious, sometimes ultra-Orthodox uh, groups here that uh, are often associated with Jerusalem. There's even was talk before this war that there would be two states here, not Israeli and Palestinian, but religious and non-religious Jewish states. What this war has done that's absolutely fascinating is there's been a huge, uh, there's no atheists in a foxhole. A, a lot of of um, people who are not particularly religious are have been drawn to traditional forms of, 
of Judaism in the weeks since the war started. And I think there's an identity, an identification of more Israelis with world Jewry that was not so strong before. So there's a uh, camaraderie and sympathy, not that there wasn't there before, but it's much more intense and much stronger in the aftermath of these protests and uh, and violence. You know, as you know, uh, a Jewish uh, person was killed at a, at a pro-Palestinian protest uh, yesterday in Los Angeles. Uh, so the people here are very, oh, very aware of that and identify with it in a way I, they might not have done so strongly uh, a month ago. Russ, you're, you're at a liberal arts university. And one of the things I've been trying to figure out is how the hell do we get here? You know, the on October 7th, my wife and I were at Auschwitz-Birkenau. And, um, you know, I couldn't believe the, the attacks. Like everybody was just shocked at these attacks. And now to see people protesting and chanting slogans like from the river to the sea, which can cannot be interpreted as anything but a genocide, uh, a genocidal uh, chant. You know, how did we get here? Do you think it's, I know that there are issues with maybe, you know, maybe immigrant populations who are, who are sympathetic to the Palestinians, but these are pro-Hamas protesters from my perspective. And many of them, you know, are not from the region. And how much do you think of this is, is due to what we might call a curriculum of self-loathing in in uh, in universities in, in which uh, young people have been subjected to, you know, postmodernist, you know, post-colonial theories, various critical theories uh, that that actually have been have been inflicted on them in orthodoxy uh, that is anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, almost unthinking uh, and 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 and, uh, and separate from any kind of humaneness. It, it seems as if it's it's a self-righteous, um, you know, but but thoroughly unethical. Uh, sort of ideology that has been embraced by a, at least a significant number of young people. Yeah, I don't, know. You, I don't know if you've seen the videos. There's an enormous amount of ignorance about the Middle East, about Israel, about uh, the Palestinian problem. I'm certainly not going to uh, pretend that that Israel has been um, uh, saintly in the way it's treated the Palestinians. I think we have a lot in the, to look at in the mirror going forward, and I'm very um i am hopeful that in the day after israel takes a long look at how we have dealt with this issue in the past and realizes that a different approach is needed uh so having said that there's an immense amount of ignorance and i, I say that word is just a factual matter the you know when you press people for what what does it mean to say from the river to the sea what is antifada what does genocide mean what does ethnic cleansing mean? What has Israel done with respect to civilians? Does Hamas tell the truth, et cetera? There's a whole range of things you can think about and look at. And I think most people aren't, not surprisingly, terribly informed about this at the level that that the um, the more intense feelings people are, intense feeling people are. And I think a lot of what we're seeing on college campuses is social, uh, people wanting to do what they think, what they think is the right thing. I think what's been remarkable about the f- first few weeks of this is that People who did what they thought was the wrong thing suddenly discovered they might lose their job or be humiliated on on the Internet. And uh, what used to be free uh, has suddenly become costly. But in terms of the general question of how we got here, I think you're certainly right. There's a I think of it very simply from uh, the work of Arnold Kling, who wrote a very, very, very powerful but and very short book called The Three Languages of Politics. A lot of people look at the world. We call them progressives, liberals on the left as a fight between the oppressor and the oppressed. Conservatives tend to see the world as a fight between civilization and barbarism. And Arnold looks at a bunch of issues through that lens, and it's it's very it's very helpful in helping understand how people look at the world. This is probably the most one of the most dramatic examples. Uh, many of us see this as civiliz- civilization versus barbarism. People who behead their victims, kill children in front of their parents, rape women, um, they're not civilized, they're barbaric. And we naturally in that axis turn with sympathy to the civilized folks. And so we tend to be sympathetic to Israel. People on college campuses who, especially young people, look at the world through the oppressor oppressed axis. It's definitely consistent with the Marxist axis and and that, the Marxist worldview. In that axis, the Palestinians don't have any power. So, So the story goes, Israel's the oppressor. And there is evidence for that. You can, as I said, Israel's done some 
harsh things and, and shameful things and sometimes necessary things, all of which are very tough on the Palestinian people. And they look oppressed. And therefore, you get this slogan, which I find deeply depressing, but this is out there, by any means necessary. So what happened on October 7th is, well, can you blame them? They don't have any power. They don't have tanks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that moral compass, I believe, is broken, but that's the way they look at the world. Now, how do we get to that way of looking at the world is, I think, tied into some of the your observations about postmodernism, Marxism, and so on. But uh, the part that's really surprising when you think about it is that the places that are the, the disciplines that are Marxist, the disciplines that are uh, postmodern, they're an ever shrinking part of American college campuses. And yet the people who are studying those things get angrier and louder. Uh, and, and this is what we're looking at. It, it's deeply disturbing. Ross, it seems like there's been a huge generational shift. Less than a week after the appalling attacks uh, of October 7th, a poll was uh, conducted in the US that found that 65-year-olds and older were 81% supportive of Israel's military response to Hamas. Amongst 18 to 34-year-olds, it was 27%. And yeah. there's similar polling in the UK, which shows a huge generational shift and this has been making me think along a kind of strategic line. Is Israel's position weaker today in any sense you wish to use the word than it was 50 years ago when there was a surprise attack launched by Egypt and Syria uh, in the Yom Kippur War? I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the events of that time, partly because I'm writing about it in my second volume of the Henry Kissinger biography, but I can't help feeling that compared with 1973, Israel's position is actually quite a bit worse today, not least because Israel is losing support amongst young people in the West. Is that a reasonable thing to say? Uh, a couple thoughts. Uh, young people get older, so some of their views will change, I think, over time. I don't think they'll necessarily persist. Uh, I think back to, and you can, you'll, you'll know this much better than, than, than I do, uh, that in, was it 1939, 38, when um, college students in England said, we will not fight for king or country. Not it's not enough. uncommon for young people to be pacifists for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but in terms of the strategic uh, position that Israel's in, I, I want to take it in a different direction, I actually get get your thoughts, um, Neil and HR. I what some people have suggested about the current moment is that it is forcing Israel to face the reality that we cannot defend ourselves alone. That if, for example, we were forced to fight a three-front battle, the three fronts being Gaza, the West Bank, which is right now seething a little bit, simmering and threatening to boil over, and then, of course, Hezbollah, which is the, the, bigger, the biggest threat of all three, uh, it is only the presence of those two aircraft carriers and a nuclear submarine off the coast of Israel that has uh, restrained Hezbollah and Iran from uh, ratcheting up the pressure on Israel right now. And that we can, we would not survive this moment if the 150,000 missiles of Hezbollah, which are, again, much larger and much more accurate than the ones in Gaza, were raining down on the civilian population of Israel. So in that sense, I worry that we are much more vulnerable. Let me give the counter view. The counter view is we still have a nuclear weapon, and that, that talks a lot, at least in the short run, while others in the area don't have them. The head of the Army today of the IDFs pointed out that our F-35s, which we do need to get their parts and other things from our ally, the United States, but that those F-35s can reach anywhere in the Middle East. Yes, they can, and they're very powerful. Um, is it the case that we are as self-sufficient as we think we are, or do we now more than ever need the United States? What's your view on that? No, Russ, you know, I, I think that I think that's true when you have you when you're you when you're surrounded by the so-called circle of fire. And and I think there's actually a fourth front in, in Syria uh with with a proxy army that Iran is trying to assemble on the on the Syrian border. Yep. I, I wonder, Russ, uh when Israel Maybe it may have already come to this conclusion. 
that uh, we'll we'll conclude that it has to act against the real return address uh, for for this these problem sets, which is Tehran. I think one of the reasons why uh, this this kind of force has been able to be assembled uh, around uh, Israel is because for too long. Uh, Iran's been fighting this proxy war against us, and we've been fighting the proxies. We have not been really imposing the cost on Iran associated with you know with the egregious nature of its support for these various terrorist organizations. Uh, yeah, let me say something about that, Neil, and uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, a very wise, thoughtful person uh, about two weeks before October 7th told me that he was very worried about the security of Israel. I said, why? I said, well, right now there's somebody sitting in Iran who's on the U.S. on the U.S. desk. And that person is thinking uh, there's never been a lower level of support for Israel from the United States than right now. And I think that was probably pretty accurate on October uh, in late in late uh, in late September. Biden and Netanyahu had never talked Um uh, the Democratic Party is much less friendly to Israel than it has been historically and certainly than than the Republicans. And this person sitting in Tehran is thinking, well, you know, this is a good time. The Israeli pilots, one of the great air forces of the world, Israeli pilots have not uh, been training lately. They've been protesting. So they're not at 100 percent. The country has been is riven by civil war over this judicial civil strife by this judicial reform. There's there. There's people are leaving, threatening to leave the country. There's never been a better time to push Israel uh, over the over the brink, and maybe that's actually what happened, right? That's they said and, to and, Hezbollah. And Russ, we just gave them six billion dollars. Right, yeah, for, exactly. For the right? And they I supposedly mean, waited until that came through, and then said to Hamas, "Okay, go ahead." Um, I, I think that's somewhat true. I can't imagine they anticipated. I certainly didn't. I don't know if any of you did. The response of uh, Biden and the United States, the, the full throated nature of it is quite a surprise uh, to me. And I think to ma many Israelis here, we're very you know, grateful for it. Um, but nobody wants to go to war with Iran. It's a th it's the third world war. Right. Right. Up Historically, Bibi Netanyahu has ta always talked tough about Iran and hasn't done a thing about it. But he loves talking tough. What we have done is glorious. We put a, a computer virus in their nuclear pro, uh, pro program that slowed them down. Uh, I think we assassinated some of their physicists. I don't know if we ever took credit for that, but I, I don't think it was um, coming from Bulgaria. So we, we, we're running this sort of low grade war. And you're right. We don't. It, it, again, it's very much like Western history. We don't really want to go to to that level. We'd like to pretend that it's not there, but you're right. That's that's the problem, and the West may have to face that. That's the interesting question for me: uh, whether the West is going to see that as a threat, not just to Israel, but to to the to the rest of the world. Hey, before we just throw this to Neil, I'll just say there have been 90 attacks against U.S. personnel and facilities by the Iranians in the last three years. It's already a regional conflict, I would say. And of course, nobody wants to go to war with Iran. But I think if until we act that we, like we know what the return address is, we're just going to see more of this. But Neil, what, what's your response to Russ on that? Yeah, I mean, if you want peace, prepare for war. Unfortunately, that's not really been the philosophy of the Biden administration. I would characterize this administration as being extraordinarily bad at deterrence. They failed to deter the Taliban from running amok uh, in Afghanistan. They failed to deter Russia from invading Ukraine, and they failed to deter Iran from unleashing its proxies uh, against Israel. And until today, I didn't really hear the kind of language that I wanted to hear. I was impressed by Joe Biden's speech, mind you, because it was emotional uh, and compelling. Uh, but what was missing from it, Russ, was an explicit threat to Iran that if it carried on, and particularly if it unleashed Hezbollah, there would be consequences for Iran. And we finally heard words to that effect today, long overdue in my view. If you look back over the Biden administration's handling of Iran from the moment it came into office, I believe huge questions have to be asked about why they attempted to revive a nuclear deal that to everybody else looked dead, uh, why uh, uh, people involved in the administration's talks with Iran got so close to the Iranian regime that they seem to have been taking uh, instructions uh, from it, 
And we heard an awful lot about collusion with foreign governments during the Trump administration. What I've read about uh, the uh, administration uh, and Iran uh, sounds a lot like collusion. I mean, there are big questions to be asked here. And it's why uh, Israel is in this, I think, much weaker position, because there was none of this prevarication uh, in 1973. Moreover, I think the administration is more and more worried about the domestic blowback as it looks ahead to an election year. They're scared of anything that sends the oil prices up uh, because they know inflation is one of their great, great weak spots. And they must be deeply troubled to see how badly the uh, pro-Israel stance has gone down in states like Michigan with significant Muslim populations. So I, t I can't help feeling that Israel's position is, is much weaker than I thought four weeks ago, uh, really much weaker. And I'd be far more worried if I were an Israeli today than, than in 1973, when very quickly, within 19 days, uh, Israel defeated clearly defeated Egypt and Syria, and let, they let me, had to stop the fight. Let me say, true, let me say a uh, couple quick things about that, and I know, Bill, I know you uh, we need to move on. Uh, it's hard to remember how small Israel is, both in terms of geography and in terms of uh, population. We lost uh, 1,400 people on uh, October 7th. That's the equivalent of 40,000 plus Americans per, in the correcting for population. Think about that for a minute. We, we lost about 50,000 Americans in the Vietnam War over more than a decade. It's on a single day. The uh, disaster of the Yom Kippur War, most Israelis view it as a defeat. It's true it ended with the US, with the Israeli armies victorious, but the death toll was horrific. And again, in a small country, the numbers that you're going to be hearing of how many how many people have died and you know it, you think it's um doesn't sound like so many here are those numbers are, you got to inflate them dramatically to make them comparable to america so the taste for strong responses here certainly is there because we're a bit of a an island in a very tough neighborhood we're besieged but we also love our children and it's a brutal, brutal price that is paid over and over and over again. I think twenty five thousand Israelis have died in the war in the wars of the country. You think, well, that's just that's not even that's a, half of Vietnam. Twenty five thousand multi multiply it times fifty to get the equivalent in the United States, and you realize how devastating the ongoing military reality is for this this country and it's uh it makes things a lot harder so maybe we are a little weaker uh both in resolve and uh in, in what we're willing to do to do what has to be done it's not easy mm -hmm. we have time for one last uh question in this segment and uh, russ thank you for segueing to me and i love having a fellow moderator on goodfellas it always makes my life easier uh neil no need for the churchillian oration uh john cochran heard your plea and he joins us from not an undisclosed location, some airport, it looks like. John, you get the last question in the segment. Thanks. I'm, I'm here at beautiful San Francisco airport. I just landed. Russ, it's great to see you. And great to see you, John. Sorry for popping in late. You can tell why. Um, I have sort of two questions. You can pick which one you want, the, the uh, discouraging one and the encouraging one. Um, it's, it's interesting that nothing's happened on the northern border. And as I, as I see the strategic situation, the Hezbollah rockets, or uh, what, 120,000 of them, are there to deter now Israel from doing, or the U.S., from doing anything to Iran. We've talked about maybe, you know, bomb the Iranian nuclear uh, facilities before, but it's clear that you can't do that because 130,000 rockets are going to jump over Israel if that happens. With that view of it, it seems like the, you can't leave the nuclear things, are we headed to a larger war where somebody's got to preemptively take out those rockets and, and that will, of course, explode anything? Or, you know, put up at the Iranian nuclear program. The optimistic strategic question is: I hear that the, the the whole plan here was to cleave the Arab states off and and bring them back against Israel. But quietly, the Abraham Accords are still going along. The Arabs have figured out it's it's us and Israel against Iran, and that that they may even be willing to finally help with the Palestinians. So that could be an optimistic way out of this. Any reaction to either of those? Yeah, um, thinking about about um hezbollah I, I 
everyone on this call certainly knows that the joint U.S. Israeli project known as Iron Dome has been uh, an enormously important part of this current moment. Uh, we're talking earlier about running into bomb shelters. You run into the bomb shelter when the air raid siren goes off, and then you hear an explosion. And that explosion is not the rocket landing. It's the Iron Dome taking out the, the rocket. And the ones that land in a field, we don't shoot down because they're expensive. So that technology is uh, is really good. Some people have, have uh, suggested there's a Peltzman effect there. It's lulled Israel into a false sense of security. It's a very interesting uh, question, but it's a pretty amazing piece of technology. Then we have the Arrow, which we recently uh, used to shoot down a, a much larger missile. Uh, and there's talk of a laser-based thing that Israel's working on. So I don't know. It's supposed to be imminent. It's a rival, much cheaper. I, I like. I dream of the day that that uh, Hezbollah does not hold us hostage in in any way. But that may not be realistic. And they are ensconced in a part of the world that's very difficult to uh, systematically uh, attack. Unlike, say, Gaza City. Uh, what was the optimistic question? Uh, the optimistic question is that the Arab states are still interested in the uh, Abraham Accords, uh, getting along with Israel, lining up against Iran, maybe even helping uh, with the Palestinian question down the road. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I guess that's the other counterpoint to the to Neil and HR's concerns about today versus 19, 1973. Uh, we're at peace with Jordan. Their queen has made some unpleasant remarks about the current situation. I don't care for them myself, but I'll take that over an army on my border. Uh, Egypt is actually cooperating a little bit. They took some people in with medical issues and, and foreign nationals who were uh, besieged in in Gaza City. And we have the Abraham Accords, the UAE. I think they're building a field hospital. Uh, and that Shifa hospital in uh, Gaza City, I there's talk that maybe they're going to try to evacuate those folks into some kind of other facility. And if the UAE is helping, God bless them. And of course, Saudi Arabia is potentially an ally of Israel uh, as a counterweight to Iran. And as everybody knows, many people think this attack was uh, to preempt that and it'll be back on the table. So there are some glimmers of of hope, hopeful, a hopeful future. We'll, we'll have to see. And there's internal Iran. Let's, let's see if they got their own problems. Uh, that That's my most uh, cheerful thought. So okay. we'll be well, Russ, you, are, you, offer, you offered a glimmer of hope, Russ. I'm going to leave it there. Um, on behalf of all of us, and not just us, the extended Hoover family, please stay safe. And that applies to you, your loved ones, and everyone at Shalem College. We, we wish you all the best. Thank you, Bill. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. For our second segment, joining us from Munich, returning to Goodfellows is Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. General Hodges is a former commanding general of the United States Army Europe and currently the senior advisor to Human Rights First, a nonprofit, nonpartisan international human rights organization, formerly the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis. He serves as NATO's senior mentor for logistics. General Hodges is also the co-author of the book Future War and the Defense of Europe, published in June of 2021 by Oxford University Press. General Hodges, welcome back to Goodfellows. You were last with us on the May 4th, 2022 episode. That was 70 days into the Ukraine-Russia conflict. And at the time, you said five very provocative words. And there were, and I quote, Ukraine is going to win. So here we are 18 months later. General, are you still sticking to that prediction? And if so, how do you define winning? Uh, 100% I'm sticking to that uh, prediction. Uh, the amount of time it takes and the cost, it of course, depends in large part on the United States, Germany, and a couple of other Western countries. Uh, our willingness to commit to Ukraine actually winning um, is the key. And so far, we've not done that. Uh, I'm proud of what the U.S. has provided, but it has only been enough to keep Ukraine in the fight. And those are the words that come from people in the administration. Uh, the administration, for some reason, can't say our policy is for Ukraine to win, to defeat Russia. And because of that, we therefore continue to dribble out um, important capabilities that Ukraine needs. And I, I saw today the German defense minister also said, who, by the way, I think is a, a really in, impressive guy until today when he said, well, we don't need to provide Taurus to Ukraine because it's really not urgent. I mean, I don't know um, how to... Uh, wake people up about why it is urgent and why it's to our advantage. What does win mean? 
I think President Zelensky has said it is to eject Russia back to the 1991 borders, which is the sovereign territory of Ukraine agreed to by Russia, as well as pretty much the rest of the world. Um, I would also add <clears throat> there are thousands of Ukrainian children that have been kidnapped and deported into Russia. They've got to be brought back. Uh, thousands of Russian uh, war crimes are going to, they're going to have to be held accountable for that. Uh, there will have to be some sort of security guarantee for Ukraine. Obviously, I would advocate an invitation to uh, join NATO. An invitation does not equal immediate accession, despite what uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor said. And then finally, we've got to help Ukraine rebuild. Um, and they will never be able to rebuild as long as Russia sits on top of Crimea. Neil, you've been to Kiev repeatedly. Do you share the general's optimism? Well, it's more a question of whether people in Kiev share it. The The mood was pretty uh, downbeat uh, when I uh, was there in September. And what's interesting is that uh, in uh, the last couple of weeks, some of that uh, doubt has begun to creep into media coverage. Uh, you will have seen General Hodges a quite uh, a, a disturbing piece in Time magazine channeling some of the doubts that are clearly being expressed uh, in uh, in President Zelensky's own own circle. I I came away thinking, compared with a year before, the mood had really changed, and it's what you'd expect when uh, the great and much heralded summer offensive achieved, let's face it, much less than had been expected. Uh, the Ukrainians are quite frank about this. In fact, uh, I'm impressed by the, the candor with which this is being discussed. It, it didn't succeed for the reason you gave, uh, Ben. They, they didn't have the firepower, and particularly the air power, to make that offensive successful. So I came away thinking, well, uh, we've gone from uh, glad, confident morning uh, in, in 2022 when, when victory seemed attainable to a war of attrition, which is extremely costly to both sides. And uh, they're beginning to hear, uh, predictably, uh, voices, not only uh, from European capitals, but from Washington, saying, now we need some kind of a negotiation. Now, my view, and I'd be very interested to hear yours, is that there is going to be no negotiation worth having with President Putin, who's already uh, calculating that American politics is on his side, and all he has to do is hold on. By the way, I took a look at the uh, Economist's rather good situation map, uh, which they update very regularly. And uh, compared with where we were a couple of months ago, uh, you don't see a clear Ukrainian offensive anymore. In fact, you see almost as much Russian attacks on Ukrainian territory as Ukrainian attacks on Russian-held territory. So it's hard to be super cheerful when the soldiers that you talk to in Kyiv are themselves pretty glum. I, I just wonder I just wonder where we go from here. Is it right to think of this as a Korean War situation where you have one year of extraordinary kinetic mobile warfare and then a two-year attrition process followed by some kind of unsatisfactory armistice? That's the analogy I've been working with for a while. It's why I was less optimistic than you last year. But where 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 do you think this ends? Because I don't think it ends in some kind of uh Zelensky in peace. I find it really hard to see how Zelensky achieves his war aims at this point. So um, a, a couple of points uh, in, in response, Neil, and I, it's hard to argue with anything you say, but um, I would encourage everyone to think about this Ukrainian counteroffensive in a much broader uh, construct it is so much more than just, you know, guys in trenches and, and minefields. Um, in fact, I've, I've been surprised at how much criticism there's been, even coming from the Pentagon, that was very linear, very land-centric, uh, very unimaginative, uh, versus uh, thinking about it in multi-domain, which is how the U that is U.S. doctrine, that is NATO doctrine, multi-domain, air, land, sea, cyber, and space, where you integrate all those effects to achieve whatever your end state is. Uh, instead, people are pointing their fingers at the Ukrainians. Look, these guys, they didn't use all the good training we gave them. 
we would never send American soldiers to to do that attack without having already achieved total air superiority and having provided a, a immense amount of uh, breaching engineering equipment on and on and on. And yet we've got people in the Pentagon criticizing how the Ukrainians did this, which is to me really offensive. But I agree. The, counter, the counter offensive is so much more than the land part. Ask the uh, commander of the Black Sea Fleet how the counteroffensive is going. It's going great. Uh, he's relocating out of Sevastopol as fast as he can. Just three storm shadows destroyed the dry dock in Sevastopol. Now, that's that's not a big headline, Grammar. There's nothing sexy about it, except that without the dry dock, the Black Sea Fleet can't s- sustain operations out of Sevastopol. That's required for maintenance of their ships. And the bonus, of course, was that they got a submarine and a logistics ship sitting in dry dock. Uh, and then a the couple of days later, they get the Black Sea Fleet headquarters. Uh, there were stories about whether or not they actually got the commander. As HR knows, you could easily replace admirals and generals. It's the 30 staff officers that were lost. That is much more difficult to replace. And so what do we see as a result of Ukrainian special forces, Ukrainian drones, three British storm shadows, they've proven the concept that Ukraine can make Crimea untenable for Russian forces if they have enough long-range precision strike capability. Now the Russians are having to move out, and they it looks like they just lost their newest ship three days ago with another long-range shot um, hit this uh, frigate sitting there in, um, or Corvette sitting in Azov Sea. So, uh, when I think about the counteroffensive, I think about all of these elements of it. And then if you insist on looking at the long Russian defensive line, and by the way, the Russians deserve credit. We gave them time. They used it. They yeah. used it. Um, and it and, uh, very, very skillfully. And of course, as General Zhaluzhny said in his Economist piece, even he, which is surprising, even he acknowledged that he was surprised that the Russians were willing to just keep losing so many casualties. But I thought it was important. And and General Zhaluzhny's uh, uh, piece in Economist that, you know, drew a lot of attention to stalemate word. I think, honestly, I'm not a Russian speaker, but I think that was a translation thing. They had a Ukrainian say, actually, it's uh, deadlock, which is a slightly different connotation from stalemate. Nonetheless, uh, General Zhaluzhny talked about Crimea as the decisive terrain. So it's not, you know, how many kilometers are they pushing back people having said that um every day i see more and more reports about what the ukrainians are pushing across the Dnipro, and so i would say watch this space watch what happens to crimea it doesn't matter what happens up further north in donetsk and luhansk what matters is uh as people who study operational art know getting the decisive terrain um your 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 assessment of the glumness there in uh, in Kiev, I, I would imagine that is exactly how it kind of feels right now. Here we are in November; it's already getting cold. They know that uh, their uh, electricity is going to be hit again and again and again. Although I imagine the uh, engineers there in Ukraine are very practiced at, at how to restore power. Um, but I keep thinking about Abraham Lincoln. You know, uh, in less than two years. After, into the Civil War, I don't think he had any good news in those first two years. And he was constantly looking for new commanders. He had even one of his own uh, commanders, eventually former commander, ran, ran for president against him. Um, and uh, somehow, you know, that guy persevered. He had people around him. And uh, eventually they started uh, winning and he found the, the right commander. And this is not a perfect analogy. But when I think about wartime presidents, it was a long time into the Civil War before Abraham Lincoln could even really think, we're going to win this thing. Or FDR or Churchill. I mean, uh, how deep was it into World War II before people finally thought, okay, we're actually going to win? You know, it was like January 1945. Uh, And so I I think there are uh, people not as learned as all of you on this call that are too quick to say, uh, you know, it's, we, we got to, you know, we need to find a peace agreement. Who in the world, as you correct said, who in the world thinks you can make a peace 
settlement with President Vladimir Putin in power and expect them, number one, to live up to it, and number two, for life to get any better for anybody. But I, I'd like to follow up on Neil's uh, uh, question. Uh, there's the will and there's the means. Part of these articles were the shocking number of uh, casualties the Ukrainians have taken. Are there any young men left? Um, we're still not giving them the means that they need in terms of weapons to make that decisive breakthrough. And of course, Lincoln and Roosevelt had a tremendous advantage in means. They just needed to get the whole thing uh, organized and on its way. Whereas, of course, uh, Ukraine is in the uh, in the smaller position as that. So I don't think there's going to be ceasefires or anything, but it is. I, I was very disturbed by these articles. Are we stuck for a while, at least until the West and NATO say, we're in, here's air cover and not just a couple of jets, but enough to really dominate the skies. Here's the machinery you need. And and what do you do about the lack of uh, of, of men, of uh, soldiers to uh, to get that going? Uh, John, you're exactly right. This does depend on the West, on uh, on our president and other uh, Western leaders to say to to talk to all of us as adults and say, hey, guys, this is to our advantage that Ukraine defeats Russia uh, economically, politically. Uh, the Chinese are watching. The Chinese are waiting to see, does the West have the will, capacity and capability to help Ukraine defeat Russia? to create the conditions where there can be some sort of a peaceful outcome in uh, in Israel, that we can deter Iran from uh, any sort of expansion and still have enough left over for the Chinese not to make a terrible miscalculation. I mean, I, I think that's what's at stake here. And actually, the best way to get a yes answer to all of those things is to defeat Russia. Then Iran is doesn't have their, their friends in the Kremlin anymore. The Chinese will take uh, note of that. So I, I think uh, this really does depend on us. And look, you know, we're, we're just now getting started, just getting started. I, when I hear, well, we don't have enough ATACMs, the CEO of Lockheed will tell you, I, I've never been asked to produce more. I mean, so we, we haven't even gotten serious yet about providing, uh, providing things. Now, uh, on the Manning question, that is, when I talk to my Ukrainian friends, of course, they are concerned about I don't I don't know any Ukrainians that haven't lost a lot of their friends or family members. That's that's an absolute fact. Uh, and I'm I'm always careful about numbers of casualties. You can never be sure, but that's probably a safe estimate that the Ukrainians have lost upwards of 70,000 killed soldiers. And so you can imagine how many wounded they've had. Uh, but they have about two million women and men, uh, military age. Um, and I think as they get as they continue to transition into a being able to fight a long war, manpower is not going to be their problem. Trained manpower is a is a challenge, of course. And I, I spoke to somebody the other night who is in the business of training officers, and they said, of course, you know, they have got to keep developing young young captains and and majors uh, to be able to um, keep this fight going because it's usually leaders that get killed especially in the early days, because they're out there trying to, to make things happen. That's, you know, we had some units in the, in Normandy in the first six weeks went through four or 500% turnover of their young officers. So, I mean, this, this, and that was in an army that had been training for two years for D-Day. So um, I think the Russians actually have a bigger manpower challenge than do the Ukrainians. H.R., I'd like to get your thoughts on two things. First of all, uh, what the general said about uh, the United States essentially, in essence, having to juggle three balls at the same time, provide aid to Ukraine, provide a deterrence in the Middle East, and provide a deterrence in Taiwan. Your confidence in our ability to do this, if you're not confident, what has to change? But secondly, H.R., the resistance in Congress right now to funding Ukraine, how much of this is just a knee-jerk reaction to overseas entanglements, and how much of it is a referendum on Congress's feelings about how the war is being conducted. Yeah, well, on your on your first question, I think Ben already addressed it. You know, I mean, we can be Americans or you can be Americans. You know, I think that what we have to do is is recognize that what we have we we have let our 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 defense industrial capacity, our defense industrial base atrophy. Right, we were procuring munitions at the minimum levels for many many years uh, as a, as a way uh, to to uh, to save money. Because we our, our defense spending had had uh, atrophied under the Obama administration, and there wasn't enough 
predictable increase uh, following the, the Trump administration. So I, I think Ben is right. We've been complacent for too long. And what we have to do is recognize the interconnected nature of these conflicts. As Ben said, you know, uh, you know, we can at least expect right our adversaries in other arenas of competition, other regions, to take advantage of our preoccupation or or our effort in another to try to accomplish their objectives while while we're preoccupied uh, with another problem set. I think this probably went into Iran's calculations and has been alluded, you know, to China's China's watching this. So. There have been some initial actions, Ben, you probably know more about the details than I do, to expand the defense industrial base and the National Defense Authorization Act and so forth. But what our, what our industry needs are multi-year contracts and a degree of predictability that will allow them to open up additional manufacturing capacity uh, and make those investments, as well as we need to take a number of actions to shore up supply chains uh, and, to, and to ensure that those supply chains don't have single points of, of failure or vulnerability, especially associated with uh, with China uh, and, and Chinese owned uh, entities abroad. So we can do it. I mean, yes, we can, you know, I mean, we can, we, uh, I think in terms of defense capacity, m- much of what we've provided to Ukraine has increased our defense readiness because we provided equipment to, and, and weapon systems to Ukraine. And guess what? We're buying and manufacturing new stuff and and just the, we, the realization that our capacity is, has atrophied has led to, as I mentioned, a number of initiatives. I forget what the exact number has been uh, in, in terms of uh, investments in the defense industrial base. But but then also uh, what Ben was saying, too, I think, is that is that there are a range of capabilities that can make a big difference for the Ukrainians at this moment. And and I think, Ben, what you're about to say is that, you know, it, it, we're, we're worried about, obviously, Ukrainian capacity. But when you compare especially manpower, woman power, the right demographic are are those of military age who are willing to serve and comparing that, I think, to the Russians, Ukrainians. But but Ben, that's uh, that's uh, and and, uh, and Bill, that's my initial reaction to the interconnectedness of these. And, and, you know, by the way, too, you hear other people make an argument. And Ben, you might want to run down all these kind of arguments. Why to not support Ukraine and just knock them down because they're all straw men. One of them is that that uh, the support to Ukraine is impeding our effort to to bolster Taiwan's defense capabilities. Actually, that's not true. The the the, uh, the weapon systems that are on back order for Taiwan uh, are 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 distinct uh, from those that, that are important uh, to to uh, to Ukraine's defense capabilities. For for example, so so Ben, that's my uh, and and Bill's my quick reaction is they are these are interconnected, and one of the ways to make sure that we don't have even more conflict on our hands that we aren't. On a path to you know some form of World War III, is to defeat Russia uh, in Ukraine to help the Ukrainians regain all the territory and and become a free, independent, viable state that's capable of defending itself. So, ben- Peter, I have a question for you, yeah. and I'm sure General Hodges will have thoughts on this too. Are the Russians right to think that if Donald Trump is reelected, they win? Yeah. Okay, so so and this this, this goes to, to Bill's second question too, which I didn't answer. You know, why are we having these these uh, these difficulties? So you know, I'm not a political scientist, although some of my good friends there at Hoover are. Right? <laughs> so I, I think this has a lot to do with this narrow thin majority in the House of Representatives and a small group of neo isolationist nativist, whatever you want to call this, this alt right, whoever, whatever, however they identify, uh, having a magnified voice. When I talk to members of Congress and and I, I advise a, a really great, uh, a really great uh, uh, organization called With Honor Action that sponsors veterans to run for Congress in both parties, and they have to adopt kind of a bipartisan attitude. And maybe that's self-selecting, but what what I hear from from this group and from Rye Barkat, who runs that organization, is there is a great deal of consensus, bipartisan consensus, to sustain the support for for Ukraine. I think we could get past it. And to your question, you know, about okay, what is how does Donald Trump figure into this equation? Hey, if if there is a, a president Donald Trump again, he's going to need Congress to get anything done that he wants to get done. And, and I think that that he would he would readily allow himself to be convinced to sustain support for Ukraine uh, in exchange for him being able to pursue successfully his domestic and, and other agendas uh, with with uh, the Congress. So that's my thought of it. I don't think it's doomsday. I mean, I'm believe me, I'm concerned. I'm gravely concerned about it because I have 
doubts about his worldview, the consistency of his worldview. Uh, but but I don't think it's a doomsday scenario. And and Ben, let me throw those questions over over to you. Well, uh, artillery ammunition. Uh, the U.S. has quadrupled its uh, production of one five five artillery ammo. Uh, we were producing seven thousand rounds a month because that's what we consumed in our own training. So that was that was enough. Uh, now, in a little over a year, they increased it to 27,000 rounds a month. And that was a matter of the department putting money on it. You know, our defense industries are great, but they're not charities. They have thousands of employees and very sophisticated supply chains. And so uh, political will is often uh, manifested in the form of money invested into what's needed. And so we're finally getting moving there. We do have a problem, though, on some of the precision uh, preferred munitions like the GMLRS rocket fired by the HIMARS. You know, there's one little plant in Camden, Arkansas that makes it. And there's one company that makes the motor, the rocket motor in the back of that thing. And so uh, we've got we've got a real problem there. Um, I think that the um, most of what we have provided, you said it quite well, to Ukraine is not something that we really need if we were in a fight with China. I mean, it's, it, we're talking two different geographies, different types of fights. There's just not, you know, we're may, we're not having to make a choice. Do we hang on to this for fighting the Chinese or do we use it? Do we give it to you uh, to Ukraine? The um, the Congress, it, it has just really been difficult for me to understand how the Republican Party, the party of Reagan, you know, openly espouses Kremlin talking points and embraces them. It, it's, it's incredible to me. So I can only imagine that this is uh, also not being a political scientist, but um, part of this is if Biden's for it, they're against it. There's a, there's a piece of that, I think, from a political opportunity. Uh, then there is this isolationist streak uh, in the American uh, populace. Um, and people are easy. Of course, most people are more worried about our border than they are Ukraine's border, because that's not what, something that they think about. Uh, and, and this is where the president, it's burdens on him and his administration to explain to people why this matters. And other leaders have to explain why this matters. And I think, frankly, most people, when you say, well, look, American economic prosperity depends on European economic prosperity. And European economic prosperity depends on stability and security, uh, grain flowing, energy flowing markets. So it's to our benefit that Ukraine is successful. If they're not, then we're going to have continued uh, disruption of grain. I was speaking to a member of parliament last week, and he said UK food prices are up 17%, directly attributable to the disruption of Ukrainian grain. That That's that's not inconsequential. And so um, I think the, the president has to explain this and that China is watching. And that if, if, if your priority, like Senator Hawley, is, you know, forget this, we got to focus on China, okay, stopping Russia helps. I think we're missing three big pictures here. One is, if there is a new President Trump, nobody can predict what the heck this guy's going to do. And the level of chaos in U.S. domestic politics in the first couple of years of the new Trump administration will be off the charts. And, and uh, it, you know, the idea of him even having a program and getting it through Congress, we're going to be in the courts, we're going to be in the streets. It's going to be a, a mess. Uh, on Ukraine, Or just the dissonance in his own mind about this. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, he's, <laughs> the guy, you can't predict for as the guy, but then the, the chaos of, of, the, of the U.S. domestic, if that happens, is going to be far beyond this. On Ukraine, I, I worry that we're just talking about, you know, enough aid to keep the dribble going. But, you know, from both of you military guys, you know, you want a successful combined arms offensive that it requires just a quality, quality, quantitative, you know, much more of everything and stuff that they're not even getting. So it, I'm not even hearing. Uh, enough to get that going. And and even Ben, I don't think, has been loud enough on why this matters. It's not just about grain prices going up in, in the UK for a while until Kansas produces more grain. This is existential. Uh, are we going to be, are, is this going to end in a stalemate? And is not a negotiation, just to sit there for a while? And, and therefore, they're already calling for ceasefire in Israel. Is that going to end in a stalemate? And once again, and we haven't responded. Host, host, you know, Putin's hosting Hamas. Right. I mean, exactly. More evidence of 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 Putin's hostility to us. Right. I mean, just look at what what the actions are. Of the so Kremlin. this is about we don't live in a world where 
we keep losing over and over again, where people invade and take over countries. That's that's really existential, far beyond you know small matters of grain crisis. Absolutely. Hey, I just I wanted to pick up on on something here too, Ben. On just on will, right? You talked about the multiple domains. Will is a domain, and you touched on this a little bit already. Hey, Ben, I I'll tell you, you have you have a good appreciation for Ukrainian will, right? Will of the government will of those in the armed forces to continue the fight. Could you maybe reprise that for us, how you see Ukrainian will, but then speculate a little bit about Russian will. When I look at the number of casualties, right, I look at what's motivating them. They're, I mean, when you bring criminals into the fight, they're not motivated, you know, the way the Ukrainians are motivated, the way that our young servicemen and women are, are motivated, right? They're, they're motivated by their own selfish motives maybe to get out of a jail cell or maybe they're motivated by fear of an fsb agent you know capping them in the back of the head uh if they don't continue the you know the the doomed defenses that they've been conducting you know i, I what, what gives what gives me hope then is like moral collapse by the russians man i mean two, what do you two different think? sort of cultures um at play here of course the on the ukrainian side they are literally defending their homeland defending their families and so You've got a a powerful will there that has been through all of this, and they know they've got a tough winter ahead. Um, and my sense from the Ukrainians with whom I speak, although I don't have Neil's uh, recent boots on the ground there in Kiev, so I, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. Uh, there is determination, but there is a, a glumness because they have lost so many out of a generation. Uh, now I am starting to hear that there are more and more Ukrainian military age males that are not sticking around. I mean, there are thousands of them in Poland and Romania and Germany. And this is something they're going to have to get their arms around to require these guys to come back. Um, and as has happened in almost every other country that's ever had conscription, there are people, there are always people who will find a way out of it. And that's also true in Ukraine. So this, this is something that uh, they're going to have to, to fix on the Russian side. Uh, I was in Tbilisi back about two months ago for a uh, a conference there, the McCain Institute's uh, annual conference there. And uh, there's 100,000 Russian military age males in Georgia alone. Uh, they're there not because they're against Vladimir Putin. They're there because they don't want to go to Ukraine. Uh, and there are probably, I've heard different estimates, but at least 500,000 other Russian military age males that left the country rather than get mobilized. Uh, the casualties, of course, if, if you had as many casualties in, a, in one of our countries that the Russians have suffered, this would have there would have been uh, huge changes of government. Uh, all, things would have happened. It barely raises an eyebrow in Russia because almost none of these casualties come from Moscow or St. Petersburg. Uh, I was speaking with a guy last night who is, uh, let's just say he has extensive Russia experience as a uh, diplomat, and he said that, you know, the casualties, the guys who are paying the price come from the hinterlands. They come from different ethnic regions. They're not Mos Muscovites or uh, people from St. Petersburg. And so um, you don't see it in the news there. You don't feel it the way you would that you do in Ukraine. And so it's hard for me to make a, a useful uh, assessment or prognosis about how much longer the Russian people are willing to do this. Um, but Putin doesn't have to worry about, you know, committee hearings from the Duma or journalists sticking a microphone in his face. And he obviously doesn't really have to worry about an election either. So it's the people around him, the, his circle, I think when they realize that their life is never going to get better again, they're never going to get back to their yacht or their mistress or whatever it was they had. Um, that's when he'll feel pressure. Hey, General, we're going to have to cut it off there. Uh, we sure appreciate you coming on. And how about coming back a third time? Well, let's continue the conversation. Well, if if you guys can take the pain, I will always say yes. <laughs> well, I, I hope the, the next time we'll we'll be gathering to discuss Ukraine's victory. Here's hoping. I Here would like go. that. I would like okay. that. Okay. Thank you, General Hodges. No, thanks thanks so much, guys, for the privilege. And that's it for this episode of Goodfellows. But first, I'd like to remark on how wonderful it is to see all three Goodfellows on the same screen. Neil, you didn't have to give the pep talk after all. Just your powers and persuasion never cease to amaze me. Don's dedication to the cause of Goodfellas was truly moving. And uh, I'm I'm impressed, John, that you managed to get 
your uh, your connection to work from an airport. They're always extremely difficult places, in my experience, to do this kind of thing from. Yes, yeah, so uh, loyal viewers should be impressed by this. John is not just sitting in an airport. I think he's got a laptop on his uh, waist, which means he has to kind of stay stable. There you go. Uh, he has to stay on mute, so I don't hear airplane announcements and so forth. Very impressive, my friend. Uh, so that's it for this episode. We'll be back in late November, which means a couple of things are going to happen between now and then. Uh, if you are in the UK, uh, take time on Remembrance Day to honor those who sacrificed. And if you're in the US, take time on Veterans Day to honor those who served and are serving. And if you celebrate Thanksgiving, take time to reflect on all that is good. As grim as our conversations can be sometimes, there's a lot of good in the world. So remember to give thanks. So on behalf of my colleagues, Neil Ferguson, John Cochran, H.R. McMaster, our guest today, Russ Roberts and General Ben Hodges, we hope you enjoy the conversation. We look forward to seeing you the next time we're on the air. Till then, take care. And again, Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.